Hi folks, this is a short video about how you can set up a blog in your module for all the students in the module to use. If you'd like to set up blogs for smaller groups of students, that will be covered in a separate video. So first of all, this blog is going to be an assessed blog, so we're going to create it in assessment and grades area. If I go to the tools option here in assessment and grades, you'll see I've got the option for blogs. So I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to click on the button to create a new blog. So I need to give my blog a title and it's good to include the expectation of engagement in the title. So and then in this instructions area, include any information about how you expect students to engage with this blog. So um, how many posts are you expecting from students per week? Um, any kind of prompt to generally set off the um, blogging exercise and then anything about how you expect students to interact with each other. So um, are you expecting students to read each other's posts and then leave comments for each other? Um, these are all good things to think about and outline clearly in this instructions area. Also, who the students can contact if they have questions and any sort of links that will help them to complete the exercise. So links to the Blackboard help guides, for example. What I also recommend with this instructions area is that when you've finished writing it, that you select all the text and copy that and then put it into a little notepad application or some kind of note that you might have on your computer. So you might use OneNote, Evernote, um, whatever you use, but it's really helpful to keep this text handy because you're gonna need it in a little while. So I'm just using the notepad app that comes on Windows. Um, it's available on all different versions of Windows and I just keep it pinned to my taskbar down there, which you can do a right click and pin. Right. So next up, we want the blog to be available and the blog date and time restrictions we're not going to set here. It's better to set that um, at the next level. The blog participation is important in terms of how the blog will be laid out. So the individual to all students essentially means that posts are aggregated by students. So each student has their own kind of individual blogging area and that's what they see when they go into the blog. The course format um, shows all of the posts across all of the modules. So all students who are posting, all their posts will be shown together in one long list. Um, it can feel more engaging that way. It feels like there's more activity. And if a student hasn't posted yet, that is a way to um, sort of counteract the blank canvas effect. Um, I'm going to show you the difference between how those two options look later on in the video with some pre-made examples. What I'm going to do though is I always untick this little allow anonymous comments option and in this case I'm going to select the course option. The indexing entries option I recommend weekly. If it's a weekly blog as this one is, then you might want to see like the weekly um, index so that you can see what's been posted in a given week. However, it's completely up to you. Really depends how you're using the blog. I do like to allow users to edit and delete entries. Um, it's just otherwise you're likely to get a lot of emails from people who are a bit frustrated because they can't change things and I do allow users to delete comments. In this case, we are gonna be marking the participation in this blog um, and we can, you can always, you know, if you're doing something where you want to mark it as a participation or attendance type mark, you could do it out of one so that it could be complete, incomplete. In this case, I am gonna treat it as a summative activity. So I am marking out of 100 and we'll be using the undergraduate a marking schema to um, sort of explain what those marks are. Right, uh, the I would like students to write a minimum of three entries to be eligible for um, being marked. So that's the criteria for our particular uh, exercise here. And then I'm going to hit submit. So that's 
created the actual blog itself, but now we need to provide a link for the students to access the blog. And this is the thing that always confuses people about these types of activities. So this is the next step that we're doing here. So now the blog exists and we're providing a link to the blog. So this is where that description text from before comes in because I think it's a really good idea to add those instructions on the link to the blog as well. The more you can show those students the instructions and they understand the expectations, the better, really, in my opinion. So I'm going to go back to my notepad. I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste it into here. Now, uh, you might have remembered that you need to use Control V on the keyboard in order to paste content into these boxes if you're using Firefox. OK, this is where you can do the date restriction if you would like to. Um, and I always recommend doing it on the link itself just to avoid having a situation where you have two layers of access permissions that potentially contradict each other and then hit submit. So now we have our course blog. It's going to show up at the bottom of the page. I should say module blog, but the terminology is uh, course because that's what Blackboard uses. And to quickly reorder that on the page to sort of put it higher up in the list, we can use the reorder tool here and select the blog and then just move it up to the top of the list and hit submit. So now this is how the blog will be. Now, um, when you've created the blog, if I just quickly go into student preview mode and assessment and grades, initially it's very, very empty. So I always recommend whenever you set up a blog, always create an inaugural entry. It's just really important that we don't confront the students with this blank canvas. Um, it's just very, it's not very welcoming. So even just a short post that sort of sets the expectation of length of the posts, uh, what kind of standard of writing you want, it's always good to lead by example in an activity like this. So if I come out of student preview mode, I'll just quickly show you how you can set up some blog posts in here. So if I go into the weekly blog here, so I can create a blog entry up here and I'm just going to call this initial, initial prompt and because this is a weekly uh, blog post and in my little scenario I've said that it's um, we're sort of thinking about current affairs, I'd pick some kind of um, prompt that was based on things in the news this week. So obviously I would write a nice sort of exemplar post here with an appropriate length of text. But this is just a demo, so I won't be doing that. And then if I had any attachments, any guidance I wanted to include with the blog entry that I had pre-prepared, then I could also attach that. So this is how we would post an entry. So there's the initial prompt. Now, what I do recommend is if you have like weekly prompts, or in some cases I've worked on modules where there are sort of unit-based prompt, prompts that are delivered within a blog, um, then it's a really good idea to draft those and then release them incrementally um, at the right times when those units should occur during the module. Um, this will help to keep the blog feeling fresh. And, you know, you can use the same prompts every year if it's that kind of activity, but it does mean that it feels like you're on that journey of blogging with the students, which is really, really important in terms of having digital authenticity. So if I create another blog entry and uh, and then if I wanted to save that as a draft, then I save that entry as a draft down here on the right. So that would be something I could return to. I'll quickly show you how you get back to your drafts. So the way you get back to a draft is to go to this All Course Members button on the top right, click on your view, and then you can view drafts. So 
So then you would get back to your drafts and when week two came around, you can click on it and then you can post the entry. So we found this to work really effectively and you can see that this would be indexing as that option we looked at before, week by week. If I wanted to have a look at other users on this blog, so the way that I set this up, all of the posts are gonna show up on this one page, but if I just want to filter it by one particular user of the blog, then I can click on this little drop down here and because no one else has engaged with this blog yet, um, I would have to show members without entries and then I could click on their name and obviously we won't see anything, but what you can see is it brings up the marking information for me because I'm an instructor right now. So that allows me to read all of the blogs in one aggregated view and then provide the student with feedback and a mark for the blog. In terms of other things you need to know about blogs, uh, just a, a sort of central point I'd make about blogs is that a blogging activity should never request just one post from a student. Um, so if you're asking students only to produce one blog post, then that is really just an essay or a short answer type question. It's not a blog. Um, a blog needs to have more than one entry over a period of time for it to be considered a blogging activity and for it to feel authentic. So those are the key points I'd make there. And then if you need to actually edit the kind of criteria for your blog, so say you needed to change the way you were marking it or change any of the settings, the way you get back to that is via course tools, blogs, and then you'll see the blog here. And what you would do is edit it to get back to that sort of long list of settings that we had before. But the one point I would make is that you cannot change the format of the blog after you've initially set it up. But you can change some of the other options here if you need to. Okay, so that about sums up how you can use a module-wide blog. Thanks for watching.